Well, what a delight to be here. Thank you. And, uh, you know, in my mind, there was maybe 15 people in the audience and the room's almost full. So thank you for giving up your Saturday morning to hear me talk about uh, my novel and specifically my research that I did at the archives here, which I'll get to. Um, so acknowledge the traditional owners, the Tarabal and Yagara people, the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet. I acknowledge that they have occupied and cared for this country over countless generations, and I pay my respects to the elders past and present for their continuing contribution to the life of this region. Okay, uh, so I like to start with this whenever I do a talk. Um, the thing that when I've been researching this novel is, and even since I've published it, is everyone's got a story, a World War II story about grandparents and um, great aunts and uncles and usually but not always involving the Americans but they tend to feature and I just love hearing these stories and I came across one of these stories in all places when I was in uh, New Orleans earlier this year at a writers festival, the Tennessee Williams Writers Festival and um, I got talking to a Wells. He sent me the photos and he sent me part of the sort of memoir that his dad had written. And um, I managed to give him an exact date and time. So it was taken in March 1941 and there was this massive parade of uh, all the... It's, so it was actually before the um, Americans entered the war in, at Pearl Harbor. So it predates Pearl Harbor, you know, by six, six seven months or so. Um, and the Americans were treated as heroes when they arrived. Um, as it was a goodwill tour. And people flocked, about 200,000 people uh, lined the streets of Fortitude Valley in Brisbane and they had a ticker tape parade for the um, men aboard the USS Chicago and the other um, ships that were part of this flotilla. I don't think flotilla is the right word. Like all group of ships. <laughs> um, so we, he sent me these wonderful photos and look, if anyone can identify the woman in this photo, we are really keen to find out. Um, so we're putting it out there and nothing so far, but you just never know. So this lady, young woman was obviously a resident of Brisbane in the 1940s and she was out to greet the Americans. So, yeah. yeah, I hear lots of lovely stories like that. And today I'm, I'm going to actually be talking about the not-so-lovely stories of the um, American um, friendly invasion. They were an occupying army in Brisbane. There was approximately, so by the middle of 1942, there was roughly about 70,000 US troops in Brisbane and that rose to about 90,000 in 1943. So that's an occupying force. And yes, they were friendly invaders but they were an invading army and they were mostly men. So there were good and bad that came with that. Um, so just a little bit of background to kind of give you a sense of the Brisbane World War II home front. I'm sure if you're a local person, you've got parents or grandparents from this era and you've heard the stories. Um, but this was taken from a PhD by Helen Taylor, who's an historian. And this was the paragraph that kind of kicked off my whole um, PhD project. I don't have too much text to read, but I'll just read you this one. Brisbane in 1942 presented in microcosm the patterns of action and reaction which were occurring on a much wider scale throughout Australia. But in that city, the many dimensions of the moment were further magnified by two factors. Firstly, in Brisbane, firstly in Brisbane, the last bastion of defence. The various internal shifts and changes were heightened by a sense of intense vulnerability and by isolation from the centres of power and decision making. So I'm sure you've heard of the Brisbane line. Mm -hmm. yeah. Secondly, Brisbane society was sharply defined by, a con by contrast with an outside force. In no other Australian city was the reaction to the uncontrollable and rapid impact of the invasion of American forces as complete and keenly felt. And that is essentially what my novel sets out to investigate and what my research was about. Mm 
So I was really interested in the social aspect of the um, American invasion and those photographs there, which were taken from the Queensland State Library. Uh, Queensland, yes, State Library. I don't have the um, credit there, but that's where they come from. So here are some places that the book covers. Um, this wonderful map was taken from a brochure from about Lenin's, which I've got a couple of slides next on this. Um, I just love this map. And to me, these were just so, such iconic Brisbane places that the novel straddles in the past and the present. So the Brisbane River features, obviously, Lennon's Hotel, the original Lennon's Hotel, which some of you will remember was on George Street behind the um, City Hall. It's not there now. Um, I think it was pulled down in the 1970s. That's the consensus I've been getting, although finding an exact date has been difficult. Um, the Red Cross Terrica building, which was on the corner of Adelaide and Creek Street, which is where the Battle of Brisbane happened. That building's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. City Hall, um, New Farm, in particular Archibald House, which was a uh, Methodist and Presbyterian boarding house for, for young women from the country. And then South Brisbane. So you had the Trocadero there, the Cremorne, the Carver Club. And what was interesting about South Brisbane is it was a recreational space, but a recreational area specifically for um, African-American troops because they weren't, unofficially, they were not allowed over the other side of the river. So there were efforts by the US military and by the Queensland government to segregate them. Um, and there are stories of African-American men being shot by MPs, American MPs, if they attempted to cross into the north side of the city after a certain hour. Um, so as a result of that being a recreational area, so they would come into the hotels and stuff in that area, they ended up building the Carver Club, which was an American Cross um, recreational facility. And they used to have jazz bands there and all the, that was the cool club. That was the place to go. And West End was sort of part of that as well. Okay. Um, so just a little bit on Lennon's because that's the title of the book. I always feel the title is a little misleading because it's not really about Lennon's, but Lennon certainly features in the book. That's what it used to look like. Um, and this was this fabulous brochure that was published in 1941. And on every page there were detailed descriptions of all the interiors and these little drawings of the place, um, which I completely ripped off and put in my novel. And you're allowed to do that because it is out of copyright. So, um, Yeah, it's just those lovely things you find when you're searching the archives. Um, but this one was not from here, so I'm not going to stay on this one. Um, I just wanted to mention, um, before I get into sort of the darker side of the American presence here in Australia, um, a lot of women welcome the Americans. And in fact, that's kind of the stereotype that women were um, flattered, they were taken, a, they were uh, charmed by the Americans, they had more money for a start, so they were able to buy flowers and gifts, chocolates, mm -hmm. take them out on dates, pay for taxis, uh, they dressed, they, their uniforms were well maintained and tailored, even their, lo their privates had well-tailored uniforms. In comparison to the Australians who looked rather scruffy, they didn't have very nice uniforms. Um, they had miserly paychecks. And something that is probably gets a little bit lost in this discussion about why the Americans um, were so favoured by Australian women is they had impeccable manners, um, especially the first lot that came. So the ones that came with the Pensacola convoy and they arrived at Christmas 1941 so not long after Pearl Harbor they were the it was about 6,000 in that first convoy and they were prime young men in their prime they were um, uh, volunteers into the army so they weren't conscripted shining examples of young American um, manhood landing on our shores and it's no wonder the women fell for them they were as I said, they, they had charming manners. Um, they knew how to speak to women. So they would take women out on dates and they would have a conversation with them. They would ask about women. They 
And this is where Australian men lacked. I don't want to impugn Australian manhood too much. I have, my partner is one, okay, so I'm, Australian men are fine. <laughs> um, but, so you'd go to a party, men would go down one end, women down the other end, well, if that still happens today. Um, but, but men didn't know how to woo women. They didn't know how to charm them. They, courtship was a very fraught um, thing in Australian culture in the 1930s. And there was, and so it wasn't just the fact that women were dating Americans that challenged Australians, Australian men, it challenged their masculinity as well. And it challenged their idea of what women should be and what men should be. So women should be subservient, men were in charge, um, women didn't work, women should do men's bidding, you didn't really have to buy them flowers or treat them in any way, you just, you know, the, got the, the Sheila. And women were sexualized, talked about in demeaning ways, um, all those things we kind of, uh, uh, are still part of some aspects of Australian max, uh, masculine culture, which we now that nowadays call toxic masculinity, to separate it from masculinity, which is not a bad thing. But these are sort of things that, um, are a legacy of this era. So women were divided into two camps. They were either decent or decadent. So decent women didn't date Americans um, and they were kind of held up as a bastion of womanhood. And women joined in this too. So there'd be this toing and froing in the newspapers. So the editorial section where people would write into the Courier Mail or the Telegraph is just fascinating from this period. Um, what kicked off one particular heated discussion was Eleanor Roosevelt. So she visited Australia in 1943 and then <coughs> declared in the press that it was no wonder that the um, Australian women were running away with um, American men because they were charming and this and that and it caused a furor that she was kind of condoning this aspect of, of dating culture and, and saying, well, American men are wonderful. Are you surprised? Um, oh, didn't like this at all. So there was this flurry of letters to the press and on the one hand you had people writing in, including women. I think this, there was a one letter called from three, they called themselves three young women or three, three students. And they were, well, we only date Australian men. Australian men are good enough for us and, you know, we're going to, we're not taken in by the fancy footwork and the fancy uniforms and the payrolls. Um, and then this other woman would write back and say, well, I wasn't taken in by that. I have a genuine loving relationship with my husband. This was a young woman that had recently married an American. And so there's all this to and fro. It's quite interesting. But one of the, um, I think, one of the most <coughs> beautiful examples of this, I guess, romantic aspect of the American invasion was a woman called Maureen Meadows and um, she wrote this gorgeous memoir called I Love Those Yanks which has kind of slipped into obscurity. No one, to read it you can go into the state library and, and sit in a little booth and read it. Um, I think it's available in, in some other archives. I managed to get a copy for myself which was, um, I ordered through a second-hand um, bookstore what was so fascinating about this memoir is that Maureen was uh, a young woman, so she was 22, around 1942, and she desperately wanted to, and she even says, I wanted to fall in love with an American. So all the romance um, aspects of that legacy, are, 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 she talks about this in her book. She was just absolutely swept up with them, and she went to work at Somerville House which was base section three, where a lot of the Americans, as you probably know, commandeered a lot of buildings around Brisbane. So um, one of their major base camps was the base, base camp, base three, which was Somerville House, and she went to work as a typist there. And so that book is her memoir of working there and dating Americans, and it's kind of lighthearted. But what was so interesting is in my research, I, got, I became quite fascinated with this woman to the point where I was stalking her children on Facebook. <laughs> yes, uh, she had six children altogether, uh, all grown up, obviously. And 
what I worked out when I started to reach researching through the archives, through the newspaper archives, is that she was actually married and with a toddler. When she, and but in the when memoir, she presents herself as having a fiance that she felt lukewarm about, and so it kind of frees her up to have this very passionate affair with this American officer, who, spoiler alert, dies at the end of the memoir, and it's. It ha it's just it, how much is fictionalised, how much is real, is just this fascinating question. But certainly she exemplifies um, the aspect of the American invasion that people, that, that um, a lot of women came to romance. And when you read some of the archival material and some of the secondary sources, women from that period will say it was the best time of their lives. They had a ball. However, there was a dark side, and I didn't want to sort of gloss over that dark side just to present this, um, you know, one-sided view of the American invasion. So I'll leave Maureen there, but she is fascinating, and if you want to know more, I have an academic article published about her. You can read all about her. So let's move to the darker side of the American occupation. So as I was researching um, what I would say are academic sources from historians and scholars, this is where I started to see this other side of um, an invading army in Australia. So this is an aspect neglected by historians thus far. The American presence could be a negative as well as a positive experience for women's, women themselves. The Americans, even if generally friendly, were in many respects an occupying army, which entailed a measure of violence and exploitation. And so this book for me kind of became like a me too for our grandmothers. Just kind of came out around the me too movement and I realised that that's what I was doing. Um, and this is, this is how I got led to the archives here at the QSA. The incident reports of the Queensland Police provide an invaluable source in documenting the less savoury side of the American presence. So Michael Sturmer documents some of these in his article, Loving the Alien. Um, and I thought, okay, that's kind of interesting. At its ugliest, the darker side of the, American, of the Americans' relations with Australian women was manifest in violence. There were numerous other cases of sexual assault which, if less publicised, were significant in shaping the Americans' negative image in this regard. And they did also, they had this kind of positive image on the one hand and a negative image on the other hand. And um, sexual harassment, violence, assault, even things like flashing, it's all in the archives. And these are the things that led to an, uh, a negative impression. And what I said before about those sort of uh, upstanding young American men in that first convoy and in the early days, as the war dragged on and conscription entered the, um, they were, it, let's say less stellar men were being recruit, recruited into the army by war's end and they were coming to Australia and to the Pacific. So that had something to do with it as well. Um, and then this other, this was another book that kind of influenced my decision to come here and look at primary sources rather than secondary sources. So as I was starting my PhD, uh, John McCarrow's PhD, The American Occupation of Australia, was just, had just been published. And I thought, oh wow, great. And, um, I ordered a copy through my um, university library to have a look at. And it was really fascinating the things that he was saying. He said, um, even if GI offences fell short of a crime wave, there was no doubt that GIs committed hundreds of crimes, sometimes just petty theft, like stealing a bicycle, you know, breaking into a shop or breaking a, a shop front window. And then they'd because it's almost like those crimes had no consequences. Here they were in a country, it wasn't their home country, they were sort of on a rampage, some of them. Although only a small minority of the hundreds of thousands of Americans who passed through Australia were guilty of misconduct, the criminal behaviour of the few nevertheless strained relations between Australian civilians and US personnel. Evidence indicates that the more notorious American crimes angered Australians. Consequently, the US officials had worried these crimes would damage wartime relations. And a really good example of this is probably one you've heard of, is the Leonsky murders in Melbourne. Yes? No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so this happened in, I want to say, 
May 1942, or March 1942, it's one of the two. Um, over a period of three, three, six weeks, um, Leonsky strangled three women and left them in a, um, like a doorway and in a park in various locations. So it didn't take long to find him and track him down. But the US Army made a real point. So his court-martial was highly publicised. Australian journalists were invited to his court-martial. Um, and they wanted to make an example of him to say, you know, this is not the way US soldiers behave in, in your country and we will punish him to the nth degree. And they did. He was, um, he was hung, I think, in, I want to say Pentridge. I know another man was sent to New Guinea, which I'll get to in a moment. So they made a big hullabaloo of these really high profile cases because they wanted to be seen as doing something, which is fair enough. I mean, this was a serial killer. And I should have put a content warning on some of the things I'm going to talk about too, particularly coming up. So just as a, um, I'll say that now. Um, so, but as a rule, notorious crimes such as murders and rapes were given a high profile in the press with the connivance of US officials. And the accused in these cases, in these high profile cases, were usually punished severely. This made sense. And so, however, there was a flip side to this. And um, often crimes were not reported. So less, lesser crimes, so the Australian police, the Queensland police would often um, find the perpetrators, um, investigate the crime, they'd hand it over to the American authorities, authorities and that person was just moved somewhere not to face any kind of punishment. And this, the Queensland police had no authority to charge or to bring that person to justice. And there was also the level of censorship during the war was such that the US Armed Forces had a say of what went in our papers. Even the Battle of Brisbane, if you've heard of that, um, I'm sure you've heard of the Battle of Brisbane. The day after, so there was estimates of around 2,000 to 5,000 men rioting in the corner of Creek and Adelaide Street around the American PX. Now, could you imagine if that happened today? You'd, it would be in the press, maybe. <laughs> Depends what it was about. If it's climate protests, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> yes, we have a bit of censorship going on in its own way. But um, the next day, there was just a small little article about one man was killed and eight others were injured in a city riot. And that was it in the Courier Mail. It was just like, we just don't want this getting out because we don't want this unrest between Australian soldiers and American MPs. Um, out in the public because it will cause more unrest, you know. Um, but often cases, and including um, cases of sexual assault and rape, <coughs> they were never reported in the papers. So I went into the archives. In my mind, I thought, what if a young woman had been murdered, strangled and murdered, in, in, as Leonsky had done? But the US government, or the US, I should say, the US armed forces had deliberately suppressed that because of the bad publicity. So on one token, while they're making a show of looking like they're doing the right thing, if it was bad enough that it would cause bad public relations with the Australian public, they could also censor crimes, and they did. So that's why I went to the archives, ostensibly because I had a few different things that I was thinking about. One, I knew I had a murder in my novel um, and I had no idea how a police would write that up. So I thought, well, I just need to know from a research perspective, what does an investigation look like? I haven't written much crime, I've written the odd short story, but I haven't really done the hard yakka of looking at how police report crimes. So I thought, well, I need to go and look at original documents. I need to look at the files and go, okay, that's how they write up a report. What kind of things do they put into the report? What kind of language do they use? Um, so I should probably point out the difference between secondary and primary sources. So, so far I'd look at secondary sources. So they're your academic um, books and articles and your popular histories. Um, and there's lots of those about World War II and they're absolutely fascinating. 
But at some point as a researcher, you've got to go, or right, I'm going to go and look at the primary sources for myself rather than having an intermediary person describe what's in the primary sources in the archives. So I didn't really know what I wanted to find. And this is the problem with fiction. If you are researching nonfiction and you are researching a particular person, a real person, you know exactly what you're going to the archive. You're going to look for everything that's related to that person and anything that's you know, related to the, the time period or whatever. But writing fiction and using primary um, documents presents you with the problem of what, what am I looking for? I'm not investigating a real person or a real murder. And the day I came here to start researching, I'd already looked online um, to find out which um, archive police files I wanted to look at because you can search World War II stuff that's all neatly collated for you. And I thought, okay, and you can pick them by description. So I'd done that. And I came in and the archive said, the archivist said to me, she said, so what are you looking for? And I wanted to say to her, well, I want to look at a murder from 1940, early 1943, and it involved this woman. And in my head, it was very real. But what I was looking for was fiction, and I would have looked like a complete nong um, to ask about a fictional murder. So I said, oh, well, I'd like to look at murders from the war era. Um, and she said, well, the problem with that is um, there is a hundred year access period on um, investigative murders. So I couldn't. I thought, oh, okay. Well, that's what do I do now. Luckily, I had a whole bunch of other things I wanted to look at. And one of them was um, sexual offences committed by US forces. So I requested six big stacks of documents, and that was one of them. Um, and that was a lot of work. So as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking, how would I do? How would I use this in fiction? So, the files I wanted to look at, the sexual offences, that has a 65-year access period. So, that was fine for me to look at. But I thought, what about if my main character, my present-day character, came in to do the same research I was doing to find about this this murder that she wants to look at? Well, wouldn't the same thing start to apply to her? Well, she can't, she can't access a murder investigation, but she can look at up, up other things. So that's the place I started with. Um, I won't, this is, if you've been, has anyone researched archives here? Yeah, so you probably, this might be um, old news to you. You can do it several ways. Um, I, first of all, found out the ID numbers of the stacks I wanted to look at and then you put your number into retrieve item and then a, the lovely archivists go into their cold storage rooms and they bring it out and they put it in the stacks for you. It's wonderful. And this is the one that I'm going to talk about today. So I did look at different ones but this is the one I'll focus on. You probably can't see it very well. It was called European War American Forces Sex Offences by Members of the US Forces. The thing that surprised me when this thing arrived was that it was this thick. And then from 19, I think 1945 and 46 was another size. There was a lot to look at. So that was the first rookie error, if you like. Um, mm. And then I'd ordered, a, uh, I'd ordered a bunch of things on censorship and Australian soldiers um, miss. Uh, misconduct by Australian soldiers. So there was a lot to look at that day. So what I wasn't prepared for when I opened that file, that I what I hadn't really given much thought to was that these are real people. And I'd been looking at secondary sources where people have been anonymized. So victims of assault sexual assault and rape and quite horrendous crimes. They're talked about in these articles, but their names are removed and that depersonalizes them in a way. I mean, yes, you have an understanding that these things are really horrendous, but all of a sudden I was looking at these documents and here was the woman's name. Here is the items of clothing she was wearing. Here is where she lived. All these personal details and suddenly I, the 
I had a bit of an emotional reaction to this. I thought, this is actually the whole point of my novel, is to make these things real, is to make victims real. Um, they're not just incidents of sexual assault and rape, they happen to people, they happen to women. So the very first one I looked at was um, one that happened in May 1942. And you can see the newspaper article, which I immediately looked up on Trove. And there it is, it was the same newspaper article. And this was about, actually I'll just read you the bit from the book, rather than me explaining it to you. I'm going for time. Olivia sifted through the cases making notes of the date. She pulled out a manila folder marked 1942. Odd that it should be grouped with what ostensibly were cases from 1943 to 45. Clerical convenience or indifference, probably. <coughs> if a serial rapist was responsible for the River Girl murder, then it made as much sense to look at cases before January 1943 as after. Inside was a newspaper clipping glued to a sheet of paper the colour of a coffee stain. Though no date had been included to indicate when the article was published. So this is what the newspaper article says. After sitting for nine hours, a US military court-martial last night found J.W. Floyd, 25, US soldier, not guilty of rape, but guilty of assault and battery. He was sentenced to be confined for six months with hard labour and to forfeit $25 a month for that period. Floyd had been charged with the rape of a young woman near an air raid shelter between Grey and Stanley Streets, South Melbourne, on May 16. Beneath it was an order, approved by the Commissioner of Police and handed to the Division of Laboratories and Microbiology for the Government Bacteriologist. That's a mouthful. It was a request to examine the bloodstained pocket of the offender's shirt, hairs found at the scene and on the offender's trousers that appeared to match those taken from the complainant and a smear taken from the vagina of the complainant. It's that kind of language that starts to um, affect you as you're looking at these archives. The paper was thin and brittle as a sheet of dry phyllo pastry. Most of the right edge had flaked away, including a bite-shaped chunk of the first paragraph, which you can see. Though its gist was readily gleaned. It was dated 18th of March 1942 and was headed an American Negro soldier named J.W. Floyd has been arrested on a charge of committing rape upon one Ray J. Mason on, at South Brisbane on 16th of May 1942. This was followed by a description of the assault. Mason had been walking through a vacant allotment from Gray to Stanley Street when Floyd grabbed her by the right arm and pulled her into an air raid shelter. shelter. They struggled through the shelter and out the other side where Floyd threw her to the ground and committed rape upon her. Mason struck her attacker in the face with a torch she'd been carried and cried out for help whilst the offence was being committed. She, she was heard by a passing police wireless patrol car. The offender, on seeing the police car, ran away and made good his escape. He was eventually found at the Red Bank military cramp, camp with an injury to his upper lip, which he later admitted was caused by the complainant striking him there with a torch. The final paragraph contained the request to have the evidence examined. It was signed by one Detective Constable Jane Hammond and stamped as submitted by Detective Sergeant Lloyd. So you can kind of see the difference between what was reported in the papers and what you can find in the archive. Um, so my expectations of going to the archive and what I would do with this material changed, really, from kind of just wanting to get more knowledge to actually it's a really about the experience of, of coming to the archives and looking at these primary documents and um, trying to convey what that experience might be. So hence I wrote my experience of, of the archive into the fiction. But also what I wanted to do was um, use real cases um, to blend it with the fiction. So it's, it's kind of faction. There's plenty of real cases in here, but the case the book is about is fiction. So the question is, 
And this is something I'm not even sure I have 100% right, but always the question was, how do I treat these victims with dignity and respect? How do I tell their stories um, that gives them a voice, but isn't exploitative? So for me, um, this case, Jay, Ray, Jay, Jane Mason, the way she fought back really spoke to me and I thought, I want people to know that she, um, she did that. I felt comfortable naming her as a victim in the book. Some people may agree, but I felt okay with that one. There were other cases. Um, so I've also included this one in the book. And this felt okay to me too, even though Norma Bainbury was a um, child at the time of, of the offence. She was... Um, look, this is, this is another issue that constantly came up in the archives, was um, indecent knowledge of a girl under 17. And often in the cases, and this was an example of one, um, often they were older than 15, they were sort of 16 or 17, it was very clear that they were having a consensual relationship with um, an American who was a few years older than them. So the law says no, but the, the documents said something else. And this was one case, and it was a really interesting case, and she met this um, American cook called Willie Pikes at the Carver Club. But ultimately, the case, she was charged with being a neglected child and her mother was interviewed and her, all this blame was heaped upon her mother for neglecting her child, a mother who had to work. Um, Norma had already given birth to a child that had been taken into care. So these, um, even though the book doesn't really focus on this aspect, it is, it is there in the archives and it's part of this Brisbane history of this invading army and I thought it was an important story to tell in the book. So her story is in here, I won't read it, but it is in there. Um, a, uh, condensed version of it, that was what I was looking for. However, there were some cases that I came across and this was an example of a, quite a horrendous um, sexual assault on a woman. It was committed by um, a white American soldier. She was, she'd been at work. She got off the train at Goodna and was walking home to her house, as many women did because they worked late hours in factories, on trams, etc., etc. They had to, it was, uh, they would often have to walk home at night and she was attacked by this American soldier, and it's, um, I won't go into the details, but it was pretty horrendous. And I did not feel comfortable naming her in the book. I thought, I don't, I don't need to do that. Um, I've even blacked out her name here. I mean, it's in the archives, you can go and look at it. But I guess it was the intimacy of this particular um, case that really struck me. So there's a list of her clothing there, clothing worn by Miss um, at the time of the offence was taken possession of and are as follows. One overcoat, one floral dress, one navy blue slip, one navy blue brassiere, one pair of white scanties, one pair of corsets, one sanitary belt with diaper attached, one pair of stockings, one shoes. And I don't know about you, but it's that intimate detail that um, really got me when I was looking at this stuff in the archives. And I, I don't go into this in the book, but that was a time where I felt, I felt an obligation to the victim to still protect her identity. And a confession though, I was so interested in her as a person, I then did more research and found some newspaper articles about her in the 1950s. I found um, her obituary from I think the 1990s or something. And I filled in these other details of her life as a nurse, which for me brought her alive as a person rather than just as a victim of a horrendous sexual assault. So, and um, finally this one. So this one is, uh, this was another case that, uh, that's the victim's statement. There's also a statement by the perpetrator and a statement by her grandmother. And there's several pages. And um, 
I suppose this is the one I wrestled with the most. I really, when I read her statement, it affected me um, because it was her voice. So this was a 15, 16 year old girl talking. I'll just read you a little bit of it. I'm a single girl, 15 years of age, and I was born at Brisbane on the 29th of December, 1927. My mother is dead and I reside with my grandmother at Caston Crescent, Dara. I know an American soldier named Elmore Middleton, and was, who was attached to the 636 Ordnance Company, Archerfield Road, Dara. This company, as far as I know, is now in New Guinea. I first met Middleton at Nancy Carroll's residence at Archerfield Road, Dara, about 19, August 1942. I became friendly with Middleton, and he often visited my home and brought his washing there to be done. At the beginning of January 1943, my sister and Middleton and I started going to the pictures together at the American camp at Archerfield. The three of us went together to the pictures on several occasions. And so she details her um, relationship with this 24-year-old um, African-American soldier. <coughs> and the way she talks about how she was coerced into an unconsensual sexual relationship is, is quite affecting. So. This was one of my um, goals for this book was to give those victims a voice in my book. So I paraphrased her statement and it's in the book. It's not exactly her words, it's been edited, but it is essentially her story, but I changed her name. Again, I thought because there might be descendants, so to protect their privacy, um, but the story is there. So. That was my, that's how I dealt with the sort of the ethical issue of that and trying to um, give victims a voice but remain, maintain their privacy and dignity. And I'm not saying I got it right, but that was just the choice I made. And I did that in consultation with my doctoral supervisors and also my editors at UKP. So hopefully I've got it right. Um, the, the, I can't remember whether that one was reported in the papers, but you'll just remember I told you this one was not reported in the papers and the perpetrator was a, um, a white American, whereas this case, it was an African American perpetrator. So what would often happen is if the perpetrator was African American, it was often reported in the papers um, and that sort of was to play on people's fears about miscegenation and the black man is violent and untrustworthy. But when rapes or assaults occurred by white Americans, they were often kept out of the paper. So you can make your own conclusions about that. Um, in my book, I went with the idea that if a young woman had been strangled and found murdered and raped by, um, and the US forces believed that the perpetrator was black, that they would do anything to keep that out of the paper. And that's the line that I went with in the book. So, um, yeah, how are we going for time? Oh, perfect. Right on time. Questions, I think. And thank you. <laughs> yeah. Were you able to do any comparisons between uh, sexual assaults among the, among the locals compared to the American soldiers? Uh, I didn't. No, I didn't end up doing that. So it's interesting. So in the files for misconduct by Australian soldiers, they weren't focused on sexual assault or they were just Australian soldiers. Oh, I just the civilian population. Maybe. No, I didn't. No, well, not the files I looked at. And I must admit I was looking at a select sample, but I'm sure they are there. Yeah. No questions? In regard to the fact that uh, the concentration of American soldiers in the western suburbs of Brisbane mm. between the Red Bank military camp here, it's talking about Dara and in general. Yeah, so they're often African-American soldiers. And, but I mean, I'm just saying that in, in, in any war, in any part mm -hmm. of the world, where you have a concentration of males... Young men? Yes, and yes. young men, or ex sexually experienced men versus... Mm -hmm. Sexually inexperienced. Yeah, and uh, yes. yes. You will have incidents it's like Oh, absolutely. I'm not trying to validate any behaviour, I'm just saying uh, to just look at the impact that oh, yeah. a massive concentration of testosterone fueled males. Absolutely. 
who are often physically fit mm -hmm. and would be sexually deprived from what might be considered normal relationships in their home environment, that this can be an outcome. Yeah, and it was. It was an outcome of that um, social situation. Um, in fact, that what you're saying there is really this. The article I mentioned by Michael Sturmer is kind of it, that's the argument. He it's not his whole argument, but it's part of his argument that it's a, it was an occupying army, and occupying armies sexually exploit women, whether they're friendly or not. And you've probably heard of um, the curtain that prostitution was, although illegal, it was condoned and sanctioned by the Australian government. So even the, the rumour goes that um, John Curtin approved a shipload of um, sex workers from Sydney and Melbourne to come up and work in Brisbane. And they um, worked sort of Margaret Albert Street. There were a lot of brothels in that area. And apparently long lines going around the corner. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I'm just confused, just about your last statement, um, you had said that if there was a murder committed by a black person, that would go to great ends to keep it out of the paper. Did you mean if it was a murder committed by a white person? No, so my, I took the tack, I, I decided um, to go the opposite tack oh, with my book. No. Yeah, so the high profile murders were charged, a lot of publicity, and I thought, what if in Australia, what if in Queensland, Brisbane specifically, this crime had happened and it was believed an African-American soldier had perpetrated? I could see that from what I'd read, that the US military would go to great lengths to actually suppress that rather than um, have everybody know about it. Whereas in reality, it was the opposite. Yeah, generally speaking. Yeah, although uh, the, if you go to the archives, like I said, in some cases you'll look and you go, oh, and you can check, was it reported in the paper? And often they weren't. Sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't, but okay. yeah. Why did you go that track? Um, because I thought it, it would be, I, the idea with this victim who I call the river girl is that her identity has been completely erased. No one even knows her name, she's just a victim. So the book for me was all about recovering her, her name, who she was. And in order to make that happen, it had to be because her, her murder was not reported in the papers. So there's just no record yeah. of it happening. Mm. Melanie? Oh, yeah. You mentioned the Australian government there. Now, General MacArthur was stationed here, as mm. the, and uh, uh, the Minister for Army was Frank Ford. Do you think, I don't know whether you could answer this, do you think there was sort of a uh, uh, tape to tape between General MacArthur and Ford about what was going on? Uh, there was. I, I don't know too much about Ford. I know MacArthur had a lot of say so, and the American officialdom about what was what went in the papers, what was reported, what the Australian public were allowed to know. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's only in the in the papers side about what General MacArthur's anything at the archives about him. I didn't specifically look okay. at his stuff. Only what's at the MacArthur Museum. Has anyone been to the MacArthur Museum? Yeah, yeah it's great. You should get along with it. Yeah, um, and just what I read in sort of secondary sources. But he wasn't kind of my focus. So oh. he's a fascinating figure of history. Yeah. Um, I'm presuming that people will read, or you're you're assuming that people will read your book as a, as a work of fiction. Yes. But because it's grounded in historical fact, there'll be readers who will be grappling with... What's fact and what's fiction. What's, and what's fiction, yeah. And I, I'm interested in, in taking the opposite of what was in fact happening as, the, as a sort of a premise for the book. What responsibility do you think the fiction writer has to align their work with Truth. Yeah, what, what was actually I, I think that's a really tricky question. For me, using those sources, a as I said, it was to give real victims a voice, but also to, from a purely kind of selfish writer point of view, to give your own uh, the what you're creating a sense of verisimilitude by linking it to real cases. I don't know what the line is. I, 
I tried to be pretty, um, I, I'm hoping it's clear in the book what's real and what's not for, um, just by the language and I know, and I do explain some things in the acknowledgements, but I think every writer, especially writers of historical biofiction, you know, where you take a real historical figure, but you're essentially fictionising their biography, it's the same, same issue, is where are you taking liberties? Uh, would they have done that? And I think the, the only thing you can do is, is what's true, you present as true, and then you build the rest around that and fill in the gaps. But I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer. Part of that is in what you, in a preface or an acknowledgement or something. Yeah, the acknowledgements the help. Um, you can kind of say what was real and what wasn't. But you can't do every little thing in the book either. Yeah. But you can just highlight them for the reader, give them a, a strong mm. insight into how to read the book in terms of. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, so, mm. um, Towards the end, you were talking about how you didn't use people's names, but then earlier on you said you had used someone's. Yeah, name. so I kind of just went on a case by case basis where I thought, I think that's, I, I felt it was okay, and some, and it, where I didn't feel comfortable. And that was just a totally personal gut feeling, oh. nothing more than that. Yeah, the crime and the circumstances, um, it, whether it received publicity at the time. Yeah, I, I don't have, yeah, it was just a gut feeling. So just further to that question, <laughs> I'm just wondering then what the legal, um, so obviously you're allowed to and you've based yeah. your decisions on your ethical um, thoughts about mm. the issue. What's the legal um, time period well, for published people's names and not? Because of the 65 year old, access period that essentially legally you it's like copyright as, 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 as I understand it so um, once something's over a period of time you can talk about it freely without so if you can access it in the archives then you can print yeah it. yeah pretty much yeah actually oh no I'm wrong <laughs> Right. You have the right, as a democratic citizen, to apply for access. Oh. And you have to apply, and the archivist should have explained that to you. She shouldn't have said, she shouldn't have stopped after the problem is it has a hundred year restricted access. Oh, she may not have used that language. That might be my <laughs> paraphrasing. The point is to always emphasize, we live in a democracy. Yeah, right. I can help you to fill out a form and you can apply to the agency who owns the record. Yes, because okay. Because the archives doesn't own records. We facilitate requests for access when our users encounter restricted access yeah. periods. Then you have to be in direct correspondence with the agency, and in this case it would have been the police, Queen's Empty. Mm. Um, and you um, are given an email address and you're writing directly to legal staff in the agency. They right. sometimes don't answer, mm. they sometimes say no, <coughs> but they sometimes answer very quickly and they sometimes say yes. Yeah. And then when they let you know, yes, you can have access, if that's the decision, they also let the archives know right. that we can make available the record to you and you alone. Yes. Ah, oh, okay. You put more than one name on your access request. Mm. And then we know we can release the file, and you know you can come in, and we have to do a little bit of a process. So it's always a good idea if you've requested access to call the archives and say, have you also heard that I am allowed to see it? All right. And when we send you the form, on the back, it tells you the conditions under which you granted access. Yeah, yeah. And that would be especially important for a writer mm. because you have to, you're on your honour to not 
share in certain ways, they can put specific conditions on. And as a rider, you're much more likely to get access if it's your record or your family's family members. record. Mm. Um, the agencies have special concern to make things available if they're concerning you. Yeah, right. And also, that is completely separate from copyright. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you publish information, whether it's redacted or not, you are under the new copyright legislation. New copyright law came into effect in Australia at the beginning of this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just look up on the Australian copyright page what the new law is and how it affects you. And we try to give guidance, but we don't give legal. No, I did ring up and ask at the time, well. yeah, just to sort of get some and if pointers. Wants to ask me some more, you yeah. can ask me I did, I did ask, so, you know, and I was given the all clear, so hopefully. And you should keep that correspondence with the copyright staff. Yeah. Because they have the agency that you would like to um, publish in whole or in part mm. what you've copied at the archives. And the onus is completely on the research yeah. and not on the archives, because we publish warnings about as you yeah. One more question? Uh, you mentioned that um, you had quite a, a reasonable amount of material. And yeah. I just wonder, going through some of that material, the um, response to the police and what they actually kind of did and stuff, because it does seem to me one of the insights that you're kind of getting to is actually it starts to inbreed a culture of kind of just covering up these types of crimes, really? Oh, in some cases, not all. But p the biggest problem, really, was that the Queensland Police would do the hard yards of finding these perpetrators and doing the investigation and getting the evidence, and then they would have to hand them immediately over to the American Military Police. So it was out of their hands then whether that person was court-martialed or punished or... And that was the... That caused a lot of friction. Yeah, and that's why I think then they'd be, well, why bother actually um, investigating? Like, now we've got a problem where they're pretty indifferent to um, sexual assault crimes. And, and I'm hoping violence. that's changing. Yeah, look, it often surprised me just how hard the, the Queensland Police pursued these cases. Yeah, and, but what was troubling was a lot of the sexist language. So often there would be a young woman and time after time she would be described as being having a childlike mentality you know or, or not being the full like her intelligence was downgraded all the time as though her promiscuous her you know her sexual behavior was linked to her lack of intellectual capacity and you can't tell me that every single young woman had the capacity of a 12 year old or you know it was so there was that to deal with as well but that was completely that courage to report that seemed like you know that time yeah often it was mothers that reported yeah. as well yeah often mm. i make the comment that i think a lot of the censorship that you're putting to the americans was actually as equally controlled by the australians oh, yeah. my, my mother worked at the amb building when carfer was based there yeah right and she was involved in the transportation she was in the WAF. And, the, and used a lot of the whack women to do the, mm. the files, and she said that Somerville House was like the star chamber. Effectively, mm. the Somerville House they ran a uh, a star chamber on decision on how they handled these people who committed the crimes, and um, and um, MacArthur was micromanaged everything, including he he referred things to General Blaney out of the UK, mm. and and Frank Ford, being a Queenslander, was. You know, completely in the confidence of every decision they made. And a lot of the cover-up was really at the request of the Australian government. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember what happened yeah. in Darwin? The Australian government, mm. before the Americans were involved, the complete story of Darwin was yes. completely hushed. Yeah. Totally. And the last point is, I understand that some of the nasty endings for some of these people happened at the old town hall, the South Brisbane Town Hall building next door. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah they did. That was the MPs execution where they site, were, yeah. Execution site for various Americans who were, had to pay the final price. Mm. But I, I, don't, I don't know. But that was her story anyway. Mm. But, um, there was a very brutal murder in 1941. Um, a woman was killed in a laneway in Elizabeth Street, Doris Roberts. That, that one's quite well known. And if you go into the police museum, there's even a sort of display about it. He was hung in New Guinea, uh, Fer Fer Fernandez his name was, it was a paratrooper, but yeah, um, interesting, interesting stuff. Got time for one more? No? Yeah. One more, yeah. I'm just wondering if, um, that there were, if you came across any crimes that involved Aboriginal women? Uh, sorry, involved? A Aboriginal women. Um, well, Doris Roberts was part Aboriginal. Yeah, 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 and it's it's kind mm, it's not too many that I found in those archives. No, but there would have been. Yeah. Great. Everybody, if you'd like to put your hands together for a moment. Thank you. I will, I've got a few copies of my book if anyone wants to buy one. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, there was issues with um, getting more, but yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks Molly. Thank thanks you. for dealing with a really difficult subject. Thanks for dealing with it such compassion um, and sensitivity, yeah. it was great. Um, really difficult subjects, uh, really interesting stories. Just so you know, um, in the archives we have something like 3.4 million items, I think it's around that figure now, and something around 4% have been accessed in any great detail. So in this vast collection of archives, we don't have a great idea of what's in there. So there's so much to be discovered. And if you want to find out more, please hang around afterwards, talk to the archivists in the reading room. Um, Cynthia over there is one of our archivists, archivists as well, so have a chat to her. And afterwards, um, please feel free to go up and have a chat to Moni, grab one of the books and um, hang around and have a chat. Tea and coffee and refreshments are going to be served outside. Thanks very much. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you for